The inhumanity of humanity knows no bounds when systems are put in place which justifies their injustices. Not a day goes by without a pronouncement by the individuals who control the unjust system known as the state, who are those who seek to control through suggestion first and force second, and they have discovered what will solve society's complex issues. And the solution is always might makes right. That might at its core has led to millions of individuals march off to war against others through the belief in a state. In the early 19th century, America's force-based solution was the codification and annihilation of those who were considered unfit savages. These savages were anyone not part of white aristocratic America. They were the Irish, the Africans, the Native Americans, the Hispanics, and the supposedly feeble-minded. The truth about Hitler's Germany, eugenics, and concentration camps was that the very basis for it was started and solidified in America by those espousing the glories of social Darwinism and the extinction of those who were threatening it. Due to the increase in immigration in the 1900s, the rapid industrialization of America, and better medical practices which reduced infant deaths, there was a boom in population growth. To prevent this attack towards the virtues of the supposedly civilized British aristocracy was a eugenics plan that would forcibly sterilize over 100,000 people in America. This is the truth about the horrific history of eugenics in the United States. You are listening to Truth Over Comfort Podcast with Carlos Morales and Taryn Harris. Brought to you by the Blue Ridge Liberty Project. Hi, everyone. This is Carlos Morales, and this is the Truth Over Comfort Podcast. Today, we are joined by James Corbett. How are you doing today, James? I'm doing pretty well, Carlos. How about yourself? What we wanted to talk about was a really lighthearted topic, of course, right? Eugenics and kind of the history of child protective services. So in order to understand the history of child welfare agencies over the last hundred years, we must understand the term parents patre which is a legal term in American law that is defined as the right of government to take care of minors and others who cannot legally take care of themselves. In other words, it's about the state management of children and the way that they see fit. Now, public education is obviously an offshoot of this, and maybe we can get into that a little bit later in the show, but this sentiment was inherently progressive in the worst way possible. So a lot of times when people are discussing progressivism, they're thinking, well, progressive ideas to move us forward. Well, in the early 1900s, and even kind of now, it's not really about that. Progressivism at the time was about the course of scientific management of humanity by various corporate and state interests to alter the mindset of actions of those uh, that individuals saw as unfit people and undesirables. In layman's terms, uh, British and American white aristocrats wanted to ensure that they would be able to retain power. In order to accomplish this, they had to put it under the veneer of science, which was in fact a pseudoscience. It was based in part uh, on the work of Francis Galton, who was the cousin of Charles Darwin. Uh, Galton, an English Victorian progressive, a sect of early 1900s that leaves a kind of bad taste in my mouth, uh, did benefit official work in statistical analysis, but that work led him to use statistical analysis in order to best understand the intelligence of anyone he considered feeble-minded. He developed the term and field of study known as eugenics, a subject that you are keenly aware of, James. Can you tell us a bit about a kind of early eugenics community in Britain and in America? Well, especially as it intersects, intersects with social work, it's extremely interesting to see how that developed. And I think we have to understand the uh, our modern conception of, of social work and social workers and how that developed really came out of the 19th century um, movement, so, social movement that was going on at the time, in primarily in Britain in the Victorian era, where we saw the, the, the concept of taking care of, of the poor had moved from a charity type endeavor that was traditionally done uh, by churches towards this the, the modern conception of this being an obligation of the state to take care of of the uh, the, the the poor masses who of course had increased in in sort of size and scope and severity um, through the the process of the industrial revolution so we saw suddenly um, of course all of these workers who were being treated horribly and their their squalid living conditions and and all of this and of course the the question is well what are we going to do about this who's going to take care of it and at this time it was moving more from the purview of the church towards the purview of the state and I think part of that process as you talk about there is the the creation of a scientific uh, framework or rubric for sort of examining that phenomenon, and of course one of the uh, the the 
sort of early stabs at that, and unfortunately one that was extremely influential was the work of Francis Galton, the cousin of Charles Darwin, um, who came up with it, who basically took Charles Darwin's ideas and came up with what we would now identify as social Darwinism, um, basically saying that, uh, that yes, th there's a survival of the fittest process that takes place not just between species, but within species. And so we can see the sort of order of, uh, of society generally um, between the races, of course, there's a racial element to this, but also classes, there's a class element to this. And surprise, surprise, uh, Galton and his his family and his friends uh, the, in the British gentry there in the late 19th century decided they were at the top of that p particular pyramid and uh, everyone oh, no else shit. Was. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm funny, amazing how that works. What a wonderful coincidence and, and how, how nice if you're the creator of this theory. So basically, yes, if you're one of those nice, you know, families with a nice blood, then you're, you're obviously you're in a position of, of wealth and power because you deserve to be genetically. And of course, what are all the co uh, corollaries of that theory, um, well, of course, you start to get into the idea that poverty isn't something that develops because of a series of, of economic and social relations that have developed over time in certain ways by people oppressing others and, and things like that. It's not that type of relation at all. What it is, is it's almost like a type of genetic trait. It's an inferiority that's built into the, baked into the genetic uh, cake of, of the poor individuals. So the question then becomes, well, what do you do about that? I mean, uh, this, of course, uh, raises the question of, well, what is the solution? And clearly, if you're just giving charity to these people, if, you, if what you're doing is taking care of them in that sense, then we're, we're just fostering this poor genetic, uh, this, this bad yeah. gene pool. You're, 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 you're um, basically allowing it to perpetuate when it really, according to, you know, Darwin, it's, it's all scientific. They should be eliminated from the gene pool. I mean, that's one of the corollaries. It's not necessarily one that all eugenicists held or all eugenicists specifically was advocating, but it was certainly something that, that, uh, that was an idea that was picked up on. And I mean, it's, was, it's uh, if, if you don't mind me interrupting real quick, did Charles, did, Dar did Charles Darwin actually discuss social Darwinism that much from what I've been able to research? It didn't seem like he made a lot of, uh, as if he made a lot of statements in regards to it. Uh, the uh, so defenders of Darwin in our day and age will say that of course this has nothing to do with Darwin and Darwin himself was just talking about the species and, and evolution had nothing to do with this um, which I think is uh, not accurate if you actually read his works he definitely did um, make comments specifically about the Irish um, some of his uh, most uh, interesting invective was directed at the uh, the the Irish as being just genetically inferior, and thus you know that I mean yeah, there was I believe, a lot of that. I in believe uh, a term used in the early 1900s, up until when the Irish kind of were allowed to be white, they were called white niggers. Their their term, not mine. Um, no. But uh, but the Irish were obviously also um, chastised quite a bit. You had a number of individuals basically calling them things like as low as chimps. So that was definitely an yeah. issue. No, it certainly wasn't unique to Darwin, but Darwin certainly did um, put that in his work, and it is there. Um, so, I mean, that's something that uh, defenders of Darwin would have to deal with. But certainly Darwin wasn't the main per perpetuator or perpetrator of, of eugenics. He wasn't the, the proponent of it. He didn't coin the term. It was certainly in the family, um, definitely in the family. I, again, it was his first cousin who came up with the term. And there were so many eugenicists um, and heads of eugenic societies that are related to the Galton-Darwin-Wedgwood line, which, for people who don't know, was basically this big incestuous kind of experiment in eugenics, one could say. Um, I'm not sure they necessarily saw it as an experiment, but they certainly did believe what they were saying. They believed that they did have this superior blood, and so they had to breed with each other, and uh, they would eventually create the master race. Of course, um, what they ended up creating was a monstrosity. Of course, Darwin was a, himself a product of, I believe, a, a cousin-type marriage. Um, he himself would married his cousin, and uh, they had numerous children. I can't remember the number of children, but several of them died in infancy um, with Ooh. severe deformities. Um, once again, well, I, I, I guess I guess that uh, that great heredity didn't quite work out then as far as that's well, concerned. Well, they, they, they started to discover inbreeding was not a good idea. Imagine that. Um, if only the royal family had learned about that. Um, anyway, yeah. So so it was certainly floating around in Britain at that time, and it was perpetuated and perpetrated most, most stridently by people who were related, literally blood-related to Darwin. 
and um, and Galton formed the Galton Institute that's, that did the early pioneering scientific work into this theory. And so, <laughs> so this, um, as, as this started to transition from a scientific theory into a political theory with political ramifications, that really had its greatest manifestation in the United States. And it was transferred over, as you say, in, in what's come to be known as the progressive era. Again, it doesn't necessarily mean what we think progressivism means in our current political paradigm, but this was a specific movement and an era that was taking place in late 19th, early 20th century American politics that, as you say, did pride itself on being sort of an attempt to bring scientific measures to the political process. That was called Taylorism. They wanted to bring in scientific management. Um, and to displace um, a lot of the old sort of uh, hierarchies and, and uh, the bosses and things. It was known for sort of antitrust legislation and things like this, which itself was a bit of a scam. But at any rate, that was kind of what it was known for at the time. Another key tenet of this was that they really believed in scientific management of society. And so they looked at this scientific theory about why poverty exists. It's because of genetic inferiority. And that brings in the question of, well, then what can we do about this? Well, we must be able to, uh, through its logical conclusion, we must get these bad genes out of the gene pool. And of course, that was taken to its logical conclusion in a number of different locations. I myself am from Canada, specifically from the province of Alberta, which had a particularly sad uh, history with regards to this. They created, they passed the sterilization law in 1928. Yeah, although... Books until the 1970s. Although, they were a little behind, you know, because Indiana, of course, had the first ever forced sterilization act in 1907, and it wasn't until the Supreme Court knocked out... I, I, there was still a sterilization act up until 1974, uh, which was in... Uh, what is it? it wasn't Indiana. It was Virginia. Of course, it was Virginia, right? And so, oh, go ahead. No, no, please. Go okay. Ahead. No, um, so essentially it, what was really interesting was what I found was that kind of all academics agreed with uh, eugenics within the United States. There were 367 universities uh, in the 1900s who agreed with basically the eugenics movement. In 1937, uh, Fortune magazine took a poll that stated that two-thirds of Americans believed in sterilizing the unfit. And as you mentioned, is all kind of the better race. In their particular case, they were talking about the Nordic race. It was, in, it was also about instilling specific virtues and values into their society. So they believed, as you've mentioned, that genetics played a part in the culture that, uh, that, 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 that took part, right? So they're trying to instill a Puritan work ethic in the nuclear family. The thing is, is that it wasn't quite a suggestion, right? So you had the Carnegies and the Rockefellers who both directly funded um, the, the eugenics movement. And as a result, we got a lot of murder, we got a lot of sterilizations, and there was a uh, banning of interracial marriages, which is going on around the United States. So what was occurring was social workers would actually go to states, they would see if a black and a white person were actually married, and then they would basically tear up the contract, destroying their marriage, and then set, and then uh, removing children from those, those homes and, and putting them in other places. It was known as financially incentivized removals, which are also known as kidnapping. So outside the United States, we had places like Britain, who were going to Tasmania, ripping out the, chi uh, the children of, of Tasmanian families that they considered unfit and intellectually uh, naive, and throwing them into uh, white homes. You also, you also had America, right? So within America, what we had was another fit, unfit uh, civilization, which was known as Native Americans. So there is a two-pronged approach in the United States to kind of get rid of the Native American population, or at least segregate it. So one of the ways they set it up was something called reparations. Right? But reparations was really about keeping the Native Americans down. They set up these artificial tribes through subsidization and interference with private property regulation in their tribes. Basically, they set it up so no one could really have uh, private property except for the chief who then distilled uh, and moved all the money around. Okay, so you basically had a little uh, North Korea. So everybody's basically relying on welfare checks and things like that. They would go out to these tribes, and if they felt that a mother had too many kids, they would state that unless you get sterilized, then you will no longer um, get your welfare check. So basically they starved out all these people and then said, if you don't get sterilized, we'll, 
will uh, go, um, we won't give you any more food. With black communities, they set up a, a similar thing. With uh, LBJ's war on poverty, you ended up creating a dependency class in these artificial ghetto societies, whereby due to massive amounts of regulation, people were not able to really be able to start businesses, and you created the dependency. So again, you ended up having massive sterilizations. And in both the cases, um, with, with black families, up until the 1970s, they would go to these mothers and say, well, you have too many kids right now, and now you have to be forcibly sterilized. What's also happening in the Native American population and in the black communities was that they would also remove children out of the home if they felt uh, if they were not in the normal nuclear family. So if you had more than one, uh, if you just had a dad, a mom, and all the kids, then you were fine. But if you had a, a dad, a mom... And then a grandpa and a gram and a grandma. Well, that was considered uh, not safe for the child. It was not in the child's best interest to, uh, in order to do so. Um, James, did you have uh, did you have some more uh, information in regards to kind of how that sterilization occurred? Well, uh, it, it occurred legislatively um, in a number of different places, as you say, starting in 1907 and uh, continuing up until the 1970s. And as you say, I mean, there were there were different laws passed in different places, but they generally had the same uh, effect. And they were generally aimed at, um, for example, in the case of the Alberta example that I was talking about earlier, it was specifically mental illness, mental retardation, epilepsy, alcoholism, pauperism, certain criminal behaviors, and social defects such as prostitution and sexual perversion. So again, oh, really? that that's a pretty broad net uh, upon which you could place uh, you you could place that net upon pretty much anyone that comes across your purview if you're so inclined. Because again, I mean, this is just these sort of general categories that you can just simply declare, and they were generally declared um, through some sort of court process uh, that that some judge would ultimately be able to rule that this person was fit to be sterilized. Of course, it wouldn't always go into a court situation, but uh, but certainly it was type it was legalized. It was. Uh, uh, put through a, a legislative process and became part of the, the sort of legal system. So there was, um, there was a political process that made it possible. And I, I want to go back to what you said earlier because it was absolutely 100% legitimized by the fact that not only was this science, but this was sort of taken as bedrock science. The, it was the superstar science of the early 20th century that the idea of even questioning it would have shown that you were just a, a sort of low, low, low intelligence type of person because, you know, everyone who was any, anyone espoused it, including, of course, the presidents of the progressive era from uh, uh, Will, uh, Roosevelt to, uh, to Wilson. They, they were all eugenicists and they all, they all Quite openly bragged about that. They didn't. They didn't hide that. And of course, as you say, even in the 1930s, this was something that was quite open and quite openly advocated. Uh, you had the main body of the main research institution in the United States uh, with regards to this was the Eugenics Records Office at the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory in New York. And um, of course, that was fu funded and founded and funded by Rockefeller, and ultimately Carnegie Institution came in with funds as well. And then, of course, they exported that to Germany um, with the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute, which went on to become the basis for the German Nazi eugenic program, which we all know how that went. And so it was in the it was the case that after the nineteen in the nineteen forties, after the sort of Nazi era came to an end the eugenics started to have a bad name. So they had to find different ways to talk about eugenics and to have eugenics ideas promoted without saying they were eugenics. And this is where we start to see the language that is still currently used. We still think, we still have these positive connotations with words like family planning. Family planning is seen as an inherently good thing um, because, you know, I mean, who doesn't want to plan their family? That's a good thing. Um, we should be able to do that. It sounds like a, a type of, you know, freedom where we don't have to, we're not slaves to our biology. We can plan a family. We can have the number of children that we want to have. Of course, that also brings in things like abortion. And of course, that uh, is where we're looking at Margaret Sanger and people like that who, again, were avowed, admitted <sighs> proponents yeah. of eugenics who believed that they were sterilizing and, and getting rid of the, the bad genes from the the gene pool and talking about this in the language of the poor people, the uh, the cr the criminals, the sexually perverse. These are the people we don't want breeding. We want more people of the right type to have children and and less of the the wrong type. And that was what really motivated um, a lot of these early abortion advocates, who I, again adopted ultimately came to adopt this terminology of family planning. 
This has its culmination, I think, in, in the Family Planning Act of the 1970s, authored by George H.W. Bush, of course, which <laughs> led to the, the, a particular period from 1972 to 1976 that's been well investigated of sterilization in the American Indian community. That was a direct result of this Family Planning Act, which, of course, George Bush actually authored. So it's it's an interesting thing because when uh, when I s used to listen to like Alex Jones and I still kind of do on occasion he would talk about things like eugenics I'd be like oh he's come on now you're you're just being conspiratorial and then I realized quite quickly that he was not whenever I started really studying this uh, because it's it's not even really hidden right if you go ahead and look it up there there's been a hundred thousand there was a hundred thousand four stations in the United States over the course of a hundred years. There was uh, the Supreme Court found in 1972 that just in 1972 there were over 2,000 black women who were uh, involuntarily sterilized without even knowing it. So you had kids from like nine years old who were told by social workers, well, we need to do this medical test on you or whatnot, and they would sterilize you without even letting you know. And when he talked about people like Margaret Sanger, it's one of those kind of uncomfortable truths when we're discussing Planned Parenthood, and it's kind of eugenics background. Um, she stated, uh, we do not, not want word to go that we want to exterminate the Negro population and the black minister is the man who can straighten out that idea if it ever occurs to any of their more rebellious members. Uh, she and, talked and about and before, yeah. being savages. Just to head off some criticism that, that may come from that, there is the interpretation of that by saying we don't want that to get out because that's not what we're doing. That might be one way that someone would argue that's, about that. That's a but really from, funny way of, yeah, of trying to yeah, get around. Yeah, I mean, exactly. It's a funny way of phrasing it. And, of course, they're specifically talking about hiring and, and using black ministers to oh, yeah. promote their, their, their message, which clearly, I mean, as a, as a coordinated propaganda campaign, obviously brings its own baggage. But taken in the context of all of the other things that she wrote about about the black populations, about poor people and all of these things and how much she despised them and how much she saw their babies as a uh, as actually a tragedy that had to be corrected. I mean when you start to look at some of her other phrases that I think that puts it in the context that that absolutely there's no doubt that she was motivated by racism and uh, a eugenics ideology. Uh, she uh, she described the undesirables as weeds. Um, not exactly the nicest thing you could ever say. And she did talk about. I mean, in in those those uh, a lot of her statements, she talked about forming uh, strong uh, partnerships with uh, black community leaders. She made strong partnerships with people on the uh, NAACP. And if you go ahead and check out statistics, I don't have them in front of me right now. The amount of I think I believe it was in 2012. There were more uh, uh, black abortions than there were births, and so if you think of fetuses as being lives, as being babies or whatever, not that is more babies being killed than actually being born. That's not my particular view of it, but it is just quite interesting when you go ahead and look at the views on population control. And what really bothers me right now is if you go ahead and you check like TED Talks, for instance. Uh, they're funded by a lot of the same people who are funding eugenics plans, and in those TED Talks, you hear words like overpopulation being used all the time. We need to deal with overpopulation. We need uh, more um, uh, planning, uh, as you said, family planning and going on in places like uh, Africa, and whenever they start talking about things like global warming, and therefore we have to promote things like Agenda 21 and a lot of other programs, you start to feel a little bit uncomfortable, and if I recall correctly, there was some... Uh, Al Gore interview in which he was talking about how some people are genetically predisposed to being conservatives and wouldn't it be better if there was less of those? That's a little creepy. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, James, have you, uh, have you seen kind of when it comes to the leading intellectuals now kind of using a lot of the terminologies outside of this family planning but things like overpopulation and there's other, other ideas? Well, I mean, certainly it's been so woven into the discourse that I'm sure that most of the people who use this terminology now doesn't don't really realize its roots. And that's kind of the disturbing part of this, because I think they've essentially sanitized eugenics and, and did exactly what they explicitly set out to do, which was... Uh, it was, I believe, in the 1950s that the American Eugenics Society, and I can't remember the name of the person who proposed it, but proposed a process 
that they called crypto eugenics, which Ooh. would be eugenics basically by another name. They would just simply start to change the names, and you could actually see that process taking place in the eugenics, uh, the eugenics quarterly or, or whatever their the the sort of journal was called. Suddenly became the the uh, bio, bio biological sciences review or or something along those lines. You can actually see them changing the names of everything just to eliminate the name eugenics and putting in this, uh, these ideas. Perhaps the most blatant example of that was the Population Council started by John D. Rockefeller III, which was literally started in, in the American Eugenic Society offices and employed all of the same people, and they just basically moved all the people over from the Eugenic Society into the Population Council. So they just completely uh, changed the terminology, and um, the uh, one of the, the, the sort of hot sciences in the social sciences these days is called biodemography. It is exactly just eugenics um, by another name. So Again, people don't necessarily even know the, the sort of history of what they're studying. And, and I, again, it, it amazes me, but I, had, uh, I remember talking to someone here in Japan who had studied um, genetics. I mean, that was what he had actually studied. And I brought up the idea of eugenics. And, oh, really? I mean, what do you think about it? And, and he didn't even know what eugenics was. He didn't even know the meaning of that term. So uh, there's clearly, I mean, at, at this point, it's been so sanitized and so completely removed from the discourse that there are a lot of people even working working in these fields who do not know the history of what they're doing or the political ramifications of what's been done in the name of the, the types of things that they're doing. Well, and it's it's interesting, too, whenever people start talking about things like race and IQ and all these other other statements because the, I'm bell curve, the, uh, the, the book that came out back in the 1990s where they started discussing things like uh, uh, race and IQ. One of the things that they're lacking in understanding uh, when we're discussing this is the fact that there's more diversity in between just black individuals within their, their uh, as far as that's concerned, than there are between blacks and whites, right? So you have a lot more variability right there because kind of our evolution came from actually black individuals. It came from Africa, essentially, right? So you ended up having a larger amount of evolution at that given in time, which which is, is really uh, kind of the thing, though, whenever you have something like the bell curve, being discussed in the 1990s, and then seeing that the fact that the, the, the IQ test was basically a way where they went ahead and they phrased questions and put questions together in order to ensure that people who were astute in the British um, version of what is considered intelligence, uh, we, it would be the British people who would be raising up the uh, you know the, the higher rung as far as that concern, and the Negroes uh, going uh, basically uh, scoring less. Well, that's right, and, and IQ tests are basically a really great measure of how good you are at doing IQ tests, I, and that, I, I think we should basically see it as, as nothing more than that, um, and, and thankfully, I think that has, in the last decade or two, there's definitely been a, a growing awareness of the, the kind of uselessness of intelligence quotient as some sort of measure of anything other than sort of, a, I mean, a completely useless ability to do certain prescribed tasks on a task, a, a test. I mean, it's it really doesn't have... A relation to our lives or, or who we are as individuals and I think more people are realizing that IQ is not a measure of who we are as individuals so I'm glad to see that that idea is kind of to a certain extent being weeded out but it is taking an awfully long time to do so and <clears throat> on this very note it was just about seven years ago there was a big controversy and I, I wish I could remember the name of the scientist involved in this unfortunately I don't remember off the top of my head but there was a prominent uh, scientist a geneticist who was uh, there was a bit of cr controversy around some remarks that he made to the effect that Africa hasn't been able to develop um, like the rest of the, the world because Africans are in just genetically incapable of, of uh, I'm not sure the way he phrased it, but it was something along the lines of they're genetically um, not, not able to, to be as intelligent as, as everyone else. <clears throat> Again, I think it was phrased in a slightly more diplomatic way than that, but, but, but that was certainly the implication. It became a controversy. A lot of, a lot of people were talking about those remarks and uh, I don't believe he ever retracted them, but certainly there was uh, there was a lot of hand wringing in democracy now and places like that. But the interesting part about that was that th this scientist, where had he actually done his research? Where had he worked his entire life? He, at the Cold Springs Harbor Laboratory, the birthplace of the American eugenic. I mean, it was it was no surprise. There was a direct historical linkage between where he where he worked, where he came from, what he did, and the comments that he made. And uh, and it's completely one. 
100% blatant to anyone who knows that that history. But interestingly enough, during the whole time of the controversy, that was never really talked about. The eugenics angle to that never really came into it. Um, but this is something that is still held by people who are still respected and revered in the in the genetics field. No, and it's and as you've mentioned, you know, it's something that needs to be actually brought up within uh, discourse because this isn't just some crazy conspiracy. This is something that was legitimately occurred for a long period of time, and a lot of those people are still in control of a lot of the aspects of our society right now. And trying to kind of uh, put in, because again, I, I talk discuss child protective services quite often, but I mean, the original child welfare agencies were based primarily on the idea of effectively destroying a lot of the communities of individuals that they saw as being unfit and ripping apart families. And in many ways, they're still doing that today. 26% of the children of foster homes right now are black, even though that they're only 13% of the actual population. A massive amount of individuals in um, foster homes are also Hispanic, a larger percentage of that than their own population. And a lot of that has to do with the things I discussed earlier, which is if you don't have the, the normal nuclear family, then we're going to go ahead and destroy it. Uh, you know, it's one of those things, kind of like when people talk about... Um, uh, the, the illegal immigrants. Whenever they discuss them, they go, oh, well, they bring the whole families with them. Well, guess what? It's a little bit complicated and kind of nicer to have a lot of different family members whenever you're trying to raise kids. It's a little bit dif difficult uh, kind of thing to do, but what do people in America want right now? Well, they want both the parents to work because taxes are so goddamn high. Exactly. Then they want to stick your kid in a public school, right? Because, mm -hmm. well, yeah, two, two parents and, can raise, and, yeah. And let's bring in some, some wider cultural perspective to this, because uh, there are wide swaths of the world that would find it unusual to not have that kind of familiar relation. Here I am in Japan, where still, I mean, people generally tend to live with their parents and will continue to live with them even after they get married and have children, so that you have three generations in one household. That is very normal here. And uh, and it's it's unfortunately perhaps becoming less normal as the, the, the culture becomes westernized, but there are still you know, billions of people around the world who find that system that's currently in the United States as being the odd one out, that it's not the sort of normal way of, of human relations. And uh, lots of people have practiced the idea of having extended families in the same house for a long time. Well, babies are a lot of fucking work. I mean, it's a lot of work having kids, especially if you're not going to throw them in prison, known as public school. And then you have the nice public school to prison um, a pipeline as far as that's concerned. So don't worry, you also don't have to raise your kids after they're 18 years old because if you're in the ghetto, well, they're really, really uh, likely to end up in some uh, place like jail uh, because we, the United States likes to throw people in jail for victimless crimes, crimes without a victim, which means that they're not crimes in the uh, first place. And and on that and note, um, go ahead. part of this is that so many people want to buy into that idea. Well, then, I mean, look, you can look at these areas and look, you can look at these certain uh, races and they do have more people in jail. So therefore, they are predisposed. And what else? What is the common linkage? It must be their genetics. These people are just genetically criminals or whatever. There is a certain populist idea that continues to go through American politics and politics in many places that has... That, that appeals to a lot of people at some base level that they just want to point at the problem and say, look, we can identify the problem. It's their genes. And uh, unfortunately, that's still a very popular thing. And, uh, and it's often played upon by nationalist and populist politicians who want to play up those, those types of divisions. It's a lot harder to bring in the idea, no, there's an institutional and systemic analysis that we have to bring into issues like this. And it's, it's harder to make the case of, no, Africa has been uh, completely prevented from development in an economic sense as part of a, a strategy of, of tearing the country apart, keeping it at each other's throats, keeping it uh, deindustrialized uh, through a process of imperialism that turned into neocolonialism, neo-imperialism that continues today uh, when you look at Rwanda and Congo and all of these countries where all of these massive interventions take place, manipulations, all of these, uh, these foreign powers that continue to have so much influence on what's going on in these countries. But uh, it, that takes that takes time to understand. That takes nuance. That takes understanding. But it's so much easier just to point to the sort of continent and go, look, they're, they're, they're the inferior people. They deserve what they get. Well, yeah, exactly. So subtlety is, of course, the work of the devil. 
um, whenever it comes to these things, because essentially what you want is you want a good versus evil kind of a setup as far as that's concerned, which is rather unfortunate that people are still kind of thinking of that mindset. What's also funny, of course, is that in many ways, yes, the United States is civilized in these ways, or individuals within the United States who develop amazing things like these computers and internet and everything else, wonderful stuff, but the American government, which, by the way, a lot of white people, uh, not exactly civilized as far as international discourse and conflict is concerned when you have things like the Iraq war with 1.5 million uh, dead because 9-11. Okay, uh, so uh, James, where can people find you? Uh, CorbettReport.com, C-O-R-B-E-T-T, Report.com is the one-stop shop. On the right-hand sidebar, you'll find a tag cloud of various tags related to the different subjects I cover. One of them is eugenics. I suggest people click on it and take a look at some of the work that I've done on this subject in the past. Uh, thank you very much, and of course, as always, check out truthovercomfort.net. I'm now blogging pretty much every single day, so uh, definitely check that out. I'm putting a lot of work into that, and I'm working on a book right now, which will, more information regards to that will be coming out soon. So thank you very much. Thanks again, James, and everyone have a good night.